Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, welcome back. We're delighted to have um, our third seminar in this series. Um, it's starting to become um, very popular. Thanks very much for everybody who's um, sharing the YouTube uh, links, who's sharing the, the, the Google uh, Groups um, mailing list. Um, so today, actually, we've got, uh, we've got our first talk by an experimentalist. Um, so that's great. And we hope to have a few more in the next few weeks. Um, so just like to introduce everyone to uh, Dr. Natalia Ares. So Natalia works um, in the Department of Materials Science in the University of Oxford. She's a university research fellow from the Royal Society and she runs uh, a sizable experimental group doing very exciting experiments on uh, electromechanics and she, she's currently pushing her setup towards the quantum thermodynamics domain. So we're super um, excited to hear from you Natalia. Um, and yeah, just share your screen and I'll drop out and we'll have a chat afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. This is a fantastic idea once more. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited. Let me uh, share my screen now. Uh, I think. Is that uh, working? Uh, no. Can you just share it again, please, Natalia? Yes. Just uh, Oh, yeah. Start sharing. There we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's perfect. 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 So, um, well, I'm, I want to talk about today um, electromechanics for thermodynamics at the nanoscale. Um, the talk is going to be around 30 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm, but um, I'm going to organize uh, my talk as follows, which is first I'm going to set out the motivation uh, for, uh, for this talk and um, then you know, in the title it says electromechanics. So first I'm going to show you which is the control we have over the mechanics of our system. And then I'm going to bring, uh, bring the electron part of it. So I'm going to sum single electrons uh, to the picture and I'm, and I'm going to show you which is the control we have um, of single electrons plus mechanics in the setup. And I would finish with the perspectives of how these systems, how these electromechanic systems can help us understand thermodynamics uh, at the nanoscale. So um, let's start with, uh, with the motivation. So one of the uh, most groundbreaking experiments in science goes back to 1849, when Schulz demonstrated with this apparatus that the work of a falling weight could be converted into the heat of agitation of water, uh, in water. And this experiment was at the heart of the uh, first law of thermodynamics, followed by the second law and the, um, and the introduction of the concept of entropy. But now, what we want to understand is the link between work, uh, heat and entropy in uh, small systems in which fluctuations are important and quantum effects might arise. Now, the question is why until now um, has been so hard experimentally to realize this regime? Well, the answer is that um, it's tricky because these, um, the, the most simple thermodynamic uh, system requires, well, heat baths at different temperatures, it requires a working substance, let's say a gas. Um, it requires a piston um, that uh, might load a battery, and we have to know, have a way to know if this uh, battery um, is, is, is full. Um, so it requires um, control over many degrees of freedom uh, in a system. And the potential of uh, solid state devices has been uh, recognized already for, for this objective. And there were very beautiful experiments on nanowires, NB centers in diamond, and uh, superconducting uh, qubits. And now what I'm going to introduce you to today is electromechanic systems in which we have a mechanical degree of freedom that can uh, act as a piston uh, or battery. So in particular, 
I want to focus on uh, carbon nanotube devices that um, that we have explored. So he, carbon nanotubes are semiconductor wires. Here you can see one of them. Uh, and I'm glad this time you're seeing it in your monitor because with projectors it's not that obvious. But in the monitor, I'm, I'm pretty sure you should be able to see it. Uh, it is around two nanometers uh, of diameter. And we are able to suspend them between two uh, metallic pillars. Here you can see them. And, uh, you know, it, it's like a wire, so you can draw a current through it and you can control this current like a, like a normal transistor uh, with gate electrodes that are patterned uh, just below it. Uh, so we can draw a current through this power nanotube and if we cool it down, we can even isolate single electrons uh, in, this, in the semiconductor. And as you can see, this carbon nanotube is suspended, so it can move. Uh, and in this way, we can uh, we can couple uh, the the electronic states to the mechanical uh, motion, and this is uh, what I'm going to focus on uh, today. Um, and uh, this system, I find it uh, very promising to study thermodynamics because um, we can have heat bath that can be the electrons in our metallic pillars that we are going to call source and drain, and we can have these electrons at different temperatures. We can, uh, as I said, when we cool down the system, we can isolate a single electron that, it's, that can act as a working substance, and the carbon nanotube can move, and that uh, motion can uh, be thought of a piston, of the piston of this system. So, um, let me show you uh, also that the properties uh, in the systems are uh, in the system are, are very extraordinary, are extraordinary because uh, well we have a two-level system which is the um, elect which is represented by electron or spin states um, and also the mechanics uh, it's quite particular it has resonance frequencies going from one megahertz to 39 gigahertz it has uh, very high quality factors, up to 5 million, the, the mechanics, and it also has a relatively large zero-point amplitude. The zero-point amplitude is the minimum amount of motion that is required um, for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And uh, why is it important? It is important because uh, when the, the zero-point amplitude is big, it means that we have better coupling to other degrees of freedom in the system. So in this case, we want to couple the mechanics to these two uh, level systems. So um, let me show you now, which is the um, well, the, the the control we have achieved over uh, the mechanics. So the question is, how do we measure very accurately the me the motion of carbon nanotube? Well, we know from um, LIGO, that one of the best ways to measure displacement accurately is um, by uh, using optomechanical setups. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, we can confine a wave in a, uh, in a cavity and have some of this uh, radiation leaking out. And if a mechanical resonator is part of this cavity and moves, then the, si the, the signal leaking out of this cavity, it's going to reflect the fact that the mechanical resonator is moving. So in particular, what we can do is couple capacitively, capacitively our carbon nanotube to an LC circuit. And an LC circuit is it's, it's a circuit that is a cavity. So if we send a signal uh, through it, uh, the reflected power that it's going to leak out uh, it's going to have a dip, as you can see here, as a function of frequency. At a frequency, the dip would be at a frequency that it's the uh, resonance frequency of this circuit, and it would depend on the inductor and the capacitor of, of um, in, in the circuit. Uh, but now, if we couple it as well to uh, our carbon nanotube, to a mechanical resonator, uh, when the mechanical resonator moves, then uh, this means that the capacitance of the circuit is going to change and therefore uh, the uh, frequency is going to slightly shift and we would be able to detect that shift with high accuracy. Now there is a trick on all this because, you know, carbon nanotubes, I, I, I told you, they, they have a 2 nanometer diameter, <laughs> so the capacitive coupling, you can imagine, is rather small. So there is a trick, and the trick is that there is a signal enhancement 
when the frequency of the LC circuit coincides with the frequency of the uh, mechanics. So that's what we did here. There is an schematic uh, of our devices. So um, we have uh, connected one of our gate electrodes to an LC circuit, and we measure the signal coming out of this cavity via uh, an amplifier, a, a cryogenic amplifier. And uh, we can drive the motion of the carbon nanotube by applying an AC signal to one of the other uh, gate electrodes. And when the gate electrode moves, then the capacitance to uh, this gate, uh, it's going to change. And therefore, the frequency of the circuit is going to change. And we are going to be able to detect that, um, that signal. As you can see, we have here a variable capacitor that we can vary at very low temperatures um, in order to match the frequency of the carbon nanotube to the frequency of the circuit, which is key to have a, size, a, a significant signal change. So uh, let me see how this looks like. Uh, let, let me show you how this looks like. So this is our sample board. Uh, this is our chip. Uh, with the carbon nanotube. So if you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in, you would find uh, this uh, carbon nanotube suspended uh, between two pillars here. And something that you can see here is the inductor and the capacitor that forms the uh, RF cavity that would measure uh, the signal. So basically, there's just a, a wire connecting our uh, nanotube with, uh, with our uh, RF cavity. So what do we see when we uh, cool down? Well, to do that, we would have to, uh, what we have to do is put the sample board in a little can and the can in a dilution fridge, which allow us to lower the temperature of this device to 20 millikelvin or so. Um, so once we do that, the first thing uh, we can do is measure the reflected power as a function of frequency indeed and, and, and detect this change. So um, here in this graph, what you can see here in the blue line is for a given gate voltage, the cavity power as a function of frequency. So basically, it's this deep that you should see in this line, but you don't see any deep because I have subtracted this just to make obvious the change uh, here. So you can see there is something going on here. This is the change in cavity power. And as you change the gate voltage, uh, this signal um, changes as well in frequency. So this confirms this is the motion of the carbon nanotube because as we change the gate voltage, what we are doing is change the tension of uh, the carbon nanotube and therefore we are changing its natural frequency. Um, so uh, as you can see, indeed our RF circuit is able to detect the motion of uh, the carbon nanotube. Now, um, we can go further and look at the signal out from the uh, cavity as a function of time, and we can drive the carbon nanotube um, for some time, the carbon nanotube motion, and then we stop, and we see uh, the signal decay. So this is the carbon nanotube oscillations decaying and if we do the power spectral density of this signal, um, as you can see here, uh, we would see uh, as a function of frequency and gate voltage, again, this signal that changes with tension. And this is, again, the motion of the carbon energy. But here you can see one more thing, uh, which is very interesting, and is that you can see this tail-like dependence um, in, this, um, in this signal. And... Uh, this is quite interesting because what it means is that when the gate voltage changes, because also we have electrons going through our uh, carbon nanotube, um, and because we are at low temperatures and these electrons can go in one by one, it means that the charge in our carbon nanotube is changing. And therefore, as we move the gate voltage, we can see the tension uh, changing every time that the charge, well, as at the same time that the charge uh, in the carbon nanotube changes. So this is already giving us the first um, idea that 
Electron transport and mechanics are a couple, and there is an interplay between these two. So let me now focus, bringing, uh, focus on bringing the single electrons into the picture. And for those of you that might not be um, very familiar with electron transport, let me do a very brief uh, introduction. So uh, what we have here is we have our carbon nanotube, and we can draw a current through it. And again, because we are we are cold, we are at 20 millikelvin, and because uh, this system is very small, uh, our electrons are going to see uh, a potential uh, well, and um, the the electrons are going to have discrete energies. So this is an schematic of what's happening. So this is the uh, Fermi level of uh, one of our uh, of our source, and the Fermi level of uh, the drain. And if there is a balance between these two, there would be um, some window in which uh, transport is allowed. Here is the ladder of um, energy uh, transitions. And, uh, well, and we would have a gate which would allow us to shift this ladder of energy transitions. So um, if we're in this situation, we, what we would expect is that there is no enough energy provided to open any channel for transport. So how can we do that? How can uh, we how can we open the channel for electrons to um, tunnel in and out? Well, there are there is one way, which is um, we can change the gate, as I said, it, that in a way that it shifts the um, the ladder of energy uh, transitions and then electron transport uh, is allowed. So that's why when you change the current as a function of gate voltage, we see minimum and maximum, and that have to do with um, this situation of what we call Coulomb blockade, and this situation of, um, and this that we call the Coulomb peak, in which the uh, channel for transport is open. So, um, there is also another way to allow transport, which is increasing the uh, bias voltage, as you can see here. Um, so we can do both. We can change the gate voltage and the bias voltage. And what you can see here are the changes in current. So uh, if you change both, what you can see are these diamond-shaped regions. And in each of these diamond regions, the number of charges in the uh, carbon nanotube is fixed. Okay. Uh, but uh, in these points here, for example, at a very small bias, you can see that at, at some point there are peaks. These are the Coulomb peaks. Um, that mean that we are um, having uh, increasing the number of uh, charges in the carbon nanotube. Okay. So um, actually, this was one very good way to measure the motion of the carbon nanotube uh, because something we can do is. Um, see the changes in current that appear at different frequencies at which uh, we can drive the carbon nanotube as a function of gate voltage. And this is what you can see here. So at given, um, at given frequencies, we can see that the, 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 um, the current has changed and that that's again moving with the gate voltage because of the tension of the carbon nanotube changing. Um, now, this is a, a very good way to detect uh, motion in the carbon nanotube, but it's not uh, very precise, very, um, uh, well, the, 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 the precision is not very good. Um, and it requires that there is some electron transport happening uh, in the device, but um, it, it does not work if electrons are not able to flow from source to drain. So um, what we uh, have done with our circuit was to show that uh, we can do that with our cavity. We can measure the motion of the carbon nanotube when there is no electrons flowing through, uh, through it. So uh, what we've done to demonstrate that was to change the gate voltages of the uh, gate electrodes on the sides to make these tunnel barriers very thick. So when you make the barrier thick, um, then the time that an electron takes in to tunnel in and out is long. So um, as you can see here, this is the current as a function of these uh, gate voltages. As we increase these gate voltages, 
uh, the mesh, the current at some point gets so small that uh, we can't measure it anymore. So if you now see uh, the changes in, in current as a function of the side gates, you can see the motion of the carbon nanotube for a uh, given frequency, but then at, uh, you see here something like three volts and three volts here, you stop seeing the mechanics because there's no more current flowing through the carbon nanotube. However, you can, uh, you can see the power of the RF circuit changing, uh, showing the vibration of the carbon nanotube even when there is no current flowing through the carbon nanotube. And here there is something else you can see, and it's that the signal has these arches. And these arches, um, what they reveal is that the frequency changes slowly with electrons tunneling in and out, because even if there is no current flowing through the carbon nanotube, electrons are able to tunnel in and out slowly, but that transport, uh, but that um, tunneling processes are happening, and this is, uh, this is evidence of that. Uh, so um, this allows us even to sense transport when we are not able to see it um, in current. So this is already bringing um, the picture uh, a lot more complete. We, we clearly have an, uh, an interplay between electron transport and mechanics. And um, I'm going to show you more about this interplay now and what allows us to look uh, further into this interplay was uh, the incorporation of a, a superconducting amplifier. So this is a quantum limited amplifier that allows us to have a much better precision in, uh, in our measurements of displacement. So now we can measure displacement with a precision that is 470 times the standard quantum limit. The standard quantum limit is the minimum amount of motion required to um, uh, require, well, it's a minimum amount of motion that one can measure uh, taking into account the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? So, um, and this is in the order of 50 atomic diameters. So this is a precision with which uh, we can measure uh, the displacement of a, a carbon nanotube. And this um, estimate is rather uh, pessimistic because there are things that we don't know about the system, like the exact mass of the carbon nanotube. So we're taking the most pessimistic scenario in our most optimistic scenario. We are already measuring at the standard quantum limit. Uh, so this is awesome news because um, it means that we really have control over uh, the mechanics and we can measure it uh, very, very precisely. So uh, let me show you evidence of this. Uh, so here you can see um, Coulomb diamonds, which are these diamonds that I showed you as a function of gate and bias voltage uh, that occur that, that um, uh, evidence single electron transport in the carbon nanotube. Uh, so um, you can see those. And at the same time, we were um, measuring the signal of our RF cavity. Uh, as a function of gate voltage and frequency. And again, you can see these arches that we saw now a lot more clear. And uh, as you can see, uh, again, we, we have um, a, a slight slope that has to do with the change of tension in the carbon nanotube. Um, but in order to do this, uh, you know, we were exciting the motion of the carbon nanotube. We, are, we were putting the carbon nanotube in, in motion. But uh, when, what, we did, what we did next was to switch off this excitation. So we stopped driving. We don't move the carbon nanotube at all, um, at least on purpose, because what we can do is still hear uh, what the cavity has to say. And the cavity shows that the carbon nanotube is still moving, even if we uh, are not setting, in, um, setting it uh, in motion. You can see here that uh, we still see these arches and we still see the mechanics of the carbon nanotube. So what's happening here? Well, this was predicted by Bennett, Clegg, Usmani, Blanta and Nazarov in 2007. Uh, and they have uh, found out that single electron transport can cause self-oscillations. And 
this is this is a, a, a direct observation of those uh, self oscillations. We went a step further, and we were uh, wondering if these oscillations were coherent. So what we did was to take the signal out of the cavity and separate it into a new phase and quadrature component with respect to a local oscillator. So here what you can see is the signal that shows the motion of the carbon energy as a function of time uh, in phase and in quadrature. Um, so uh, I find that this quite nice because you can see the carbon energy moving really. But now we can do an histogram of these signals and uh, here what you can see is an histogram of the amplitude of those signals uh, in phase and in quadrature. And what we observe is that below a threshold voltage, uh, what we see is it's just rather uh, much like blob in the center. So uh, there doesn't seem to be any correlation between the quadrature and in phase signal. But above some voltage threshold, uh, we see a ring that it's a signature of coherent emission. And uh, this threshold has to do with the, th with the threshold required for single electron tunneling. So without single electron tunneling, we see a block. With single electron tunneling, when single electron tunneling is activated, we see it done it. So this is fantastic because basically we have uh, uh, an el electron tunneling creating a um, coherent microwave signal in a way that it's analog to a laser. So uh, we have our two-level system that it's our electronic states and uh, the mechanics is outputting a microwave signal that it's coherent. Um, so uh, this, this is uh, remarkable really and um, because the similarity uh, with laser physics, we were able to play some tricks that are played with um, lasers. And one of these is injection locking. So uh, here what you can see is the emitted power of the RF cavity as a function of frequency. And you can see this bump here. And that bump uh, is uh, the, the, the mechanical frequency of the carbon energy. And what we did here was to inject a signal very close in frequency to the frequency of the carbon atom and increase its power. And you're going to see what happens. Uh, the blob moves around, and the reason for that is that um, there is charge noise that moves the resonance. Um, but for a given injected power, what you can see is that um, this bump gets concentrated in this very narrow line width that gets uh, higher and higher in, in amplitude. As you can see now, it's going to grow. Uh, it oscillates a bit, but you see. And um, then in this way, we managed to um, make the line width less than two hertz wide. Uh, another trick to stabilize uh, the mechanics is to connect the output of the cavity to a phase detector. Because when the phase change, we know that the oscillation is, is slightly changing. So we can send this error signal to a PIT controller and feed back a voltage that shifts a gate, um, a, a gate voltage to compensate for it. So uh, here you can see this is uh, the frequency and uh, time, and here you can see the um, the mechanical resonance uh, in the in the cavity. And when this feedback is off, well, it has some some size. But when the feedback is on, the line width um, it's a lot um, it's a lot smaller. And again, with the feedback off, um, the resonance is is again uh, broad. Um, so you can see we can stabilize uh, the mechanics and we have a really nice control uh, of, of the line width here. So now um, let me show you what, what we have in mind and how uh, we are uh, uh, benefiting and harnessing this control over the system to study uh, thermodynamics. So what it would be really, really uh, nice is that if we have this, this, this coherent um, uh, oscillation. So we have work that, we, that is reusable. We could uh, move a wheel with it. Now, uh, of course, we are not going to attach a wheel to our carbon nanotube. 
Uh, but it's just to give you an idea of um, that, that this work is, 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 um, is measurable and because we have access to displacement measurements and it's something that we can probe and that we can reuse. So uh, what we are looking into is having a system in which we have uh, hot electrons and cold electrons and we have a system in which um, there, there is a selective coupling to one reservoir or the other and uh, we can generate work that can be measurable um, by, by probing the mechanical displacement. And uh, this system we think is very promising because uh, it, it supports a coherent quantum state, so we can have um, qubits encoded in the state of the electron. So we can study the, um, the effects of uh, coherence and quantum states uh, in the system. Um, so uh, we, are, we are very excited and taking the first step, uh, steps forward to, towards this picture. Um, and there's something uh, work in progress that I want to uh, talk about very briefly. This is just to show you the, the latest. Uh, but um, we are uh, the latest work. So we are working on, on uh, the thermodynamics of clocks, trying to understand uh, how thermodynamics of timekeeping uh, works. Um, and for this, we are using a system that it's similar. Instead of carbon nitrogen, we have a silicon nitride membrane between two pillars. And again, we connect it to an, uh, an RF cavity that allows us to measure the displacement of this membrane in real time. So here you can see the oscillations of the membrane as a function of time. Uh, and so this, this, the carbon nitrogen, the, the silicon nitride membrane motion, uh, it's giving the ticks power clock. It's giving us some timekeeping, and the uh, the RF cavity allows us to record these ticks. So that's the register for us. So uh, something we are uh, looking into is to make the balance between the resources that um, are plugged into this uh, system and the waste and how does this compare with the resolution and accuracy of a clock to understand the limits, uh, the fundamental limits of timekeeping. So uh, what's this space? Uh, there's more to come on that. Um, and there is other research in my group that, um, you know, if you're interested, uh, write to me about, uh, which is again, uh, well, the circuit optomechanics with silicon nitro membranes uh, we are doing RF uh, spin readout using superconducting amplifiers and something that um, I, I like very much, which is machine learning for quantum device measurement and control, which that space as well is, is quite cool. So um, this, I, I I'll give you my summary. So I show you resonant of the mechanics uh, with carbon nanotubes. I, uh, I showed you a coherent nanomechanical oscillator, which is only driven by single electron tunneling. And the, uh, I show you our uh, plans for studying nanoscale thermodynamics and also to explore the thermodynamics of timekeeping. Um, I want to thank uh, all my group that uh, you can see here and my brilliant collaborators. Um, there is uh, Alexia, Juan, Janet, um, there is Marcus Hoover, group on, on the clock, and, um, and well, and, and, and uh, again, um, you know, if there are uh, postdocs and PhD student uh, positions in my group, please, um, please join us. And that's it. Thank you. Well, Natalia, that was absolutely uh, brilliant. Let me just rejoin the the, the call. Yes. Oh, you can stop, stop sharing your screen now, or maybe even you can keep it there because probably that we'll have questions. Um, so, I mean, look, the other talks that we've had so far have been of uh, amazingly high standard. And I think that uh, this hasn't dropped today and it'll be very hard to repeat such a great talk. <laughs> um, ex 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 experiments look absolutely fantastic. 
Um, so I'm sure we'll have some questions from the audience looking at that, so you can take them now in the YouTube chat and I'll ask you, that's how it goes. Um, so guys, if you've got questions for, for Natalia. Okay, Sebastian Defner, let's start off. Uh, so Sebastian Defner asks, um, well, he says, first of all, great talk. Um, and his question is, either for the nanotubes or the membranes, have you measured the dispersion relation for the charge carriers for different strains slash curvature? Oh, no, we haven't. Um, and uh, if you have a good idea of how to do that, um, we would, yeah, it, it sounds uh, a very good idea, actually. I'll, I'll have to think a bit more how actually one would get to do that. Um, I, I'll think more about it. Okay, so um, I think, I, I, looking at the YouTube uh, comments, Natalia, this is, talk is going down really well. There's another talk there. Um, what is the, sorry, another question. What is the microscopic mechanism of the dependence of the tension on the gate voltage? Oh, so, so uh, the dependence of, of the tension on the gate voltage is, is, is purely, um, it's, it's, it's purely, let's say, a classical in the sense and, and purely uh, uh, electrostatic in the sense that we have a carbon nanotube with some charges in and we have a gate electrode with some uh, voltage with a, with a voltage and therefore uh, when the uh, when the gate um, increases or, or decreases depending on the relative signs of the uh, of the charges uh, we get the carbon nanotube closer to the gate and therefore uh, we change we change its its natural we change the tension and we change its natural frequency. Is that I think that's 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 fine. Um, there is another question coming in from Prasanna. She says, "Is it correct that the physics observed so far seems to be independent of the exact nature of the microscopic coupling between the electrons in the nanotube and the mechanical mode?" Uh, I would. Uh, uh, so, so again, can you, can you... Yeah, so, so is it correct that the physics observed so far is independent of the exact nature of the microscopic coupling between the electrons and the tube in the mechanical mode? I would say no, but... <laughs> no, I, well, no, I, I, I don't think so. So the uh, mechanism is still... So, so the Blanton and Masarov in, in their paper and some... Um, they... they, they they show a mechanism. Let me see if I can bring up the. Um, I'm not sure I have it there. Uh, they have. Um, uh, they explain this mechanism, and let me explain without it diagram because I don't think I have it here. Um, but the idea is that you have a, uh, an electron going in and an electron going out, and you have the two barriers. Now, if one of the barriers has, is energy dependent, uh, then as the carbon nanotube uh, moves and the energy transitions move as well, because when the carbon nanotube moves, um, you get uh, farther and closer from the uh, gate electrode, and therefore uh, it's, it's like changing the gate effectively. So the, the, the energy transitions move. And now when it's moving, um, if uh, if the energy, if the barrier is like a triangle, then what happens is that um, electrons come in faster than they come out, and therefore there is there is a moment in this in, uh, while while the carbon nanotube is moving that you have more electrons coming in than out, although you would be expecting the opposite, and this is some sort of uh, population inversion, if you want, that gives rise to the self oscillations, um, and. Uh, this is this is a mechanism that explains the self oscillations, but it's not the only one, and we can't be sure uh, that that's what's happening. Of course, it it fits the picture, but we have to do more experiments to understand which is exactly the mechanism at play. I see. So, so Natalia, um, you know, given that you finished your talk slightly early, do you mind if we take some more questions? You have some time because there's a lot of interest there. So, so let me yeah, try and pick I out some. To make it slightly short so that. Um, yeah, no, that, that, I think it's it, it it works even better this way, and uh, and and um, so there are already some uh, there's already some discussion going on about uh, with Mauro and a few other people about capacitive coupling and you know the uh, you know the, this type of thing so you can you can you can you can check it out afterwards but I let me try and let me try and um by the way for the students who are who are there obviously don't be afraid to ask a question there's no 
silly questions here. I mean, in the end, I mean, ev everything is reasonable. Um, questions are the most difficult ones. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so there, there, from Alvaro here, there's a silly theorist question. Um, can you say again how the motion of the carbon nanotube uh, is coherent? The actual oscillations of it are coherent. Is that what you mean? Yes. I yes, see. indeed. Yes. Okay. As in this, yeah. The, the phase coherence is something that I didn't show, but you can change. You can um, check the phase coherence by by taking the out correlation between the signals, and you can see that we have a phase uh, correlation of like nineteen. Um, um, 99 microseconds. Yeah. So there's a question, uh, there's another question here, which actually was something related to what I was going to ask you. So the question is like this. It says, uh, would it be possible to go over how the electron reservoirs uh, in the source and the drain act as thermal bats? But my understanding is that there is no thermal bias in what you showed yet, right? But you, yeah. do, it, you do plan to implement one, correct? And maybe you could comment on how you, how you plan to implement a thermal bias as opposed to a uh, a chemical potential bias? Well, the, there is plenty of experiments in which uh, uh, the thermoelectrics of those systems are, uh, are explored. And how, how this is done is that uh, one of these electrodes uh, you know, can, be, can be done in a, some sort of loop. So one can send some current through, uh, um, current through and then uh, this, um, this would act as a heater, basically. Uh, so one can heat the electrons on one side, on, on one of these reservoirs, and this has been implemented plenty of times to study the thermoelectrics. Because, of course, when you heat uh, one electrode and you call the other, uh, it's basically having an effective bias. Right. So this current, there is transport allowed due to this difference of temperature, mm -hmm. and this has been seen in carbon nanotubes and nanowires and other sure. structures in, in gallium arsenide, I think. Um, so, um, so that's that's how one implements this, um, but we we haven't done it yet. We are... So, so just to add to that question, I know I asked you that when I visited your lab in in, in Oxford, Natalia. But in general, in in this community of people studying charge transport and these nano devices, measuring the energy current is extremely difficult, if not impossible, as in in the current kind of is, is that right? Or maybe you can comment on what people do if they want to infer a heat current or an energy current, or can they do that? Uh, well, so yes, you can, you can infer um, uh, a heat current because you can measure, you can measure the current, you can, measure, you can uh, estimate tunnel barriers, and, it should, and just with a Fermi uh, the, um, uh, function, you can, you can basically calculate what, what is the heat flow. I think what it's uh, particularly interesting, so this is a work um, that I showed here, I might be able to, uh, it's a nice um, um, share screen again, there we are. So um, in this work here, uh, they have done this, so you can see. Yeah, yeah, this is the one in, in Lund, right? In Lund. You know, they they, uh, they show how you actually. So I'll stop sharing. Um, they they show how you actually uh, can calculate and estimate the um, uh, this um, uh, energy currents. Well, energy currents, um, and and uh, we are very excited because uh, basically we want to bring into the picture the mechanics because the mechanics would allow us to have an extra probe. Of course, on the system, a probe that it's able to really measure the work independently of this um, and so uh, we expect to have the heat current and the mechanics uh, very nice so, yeah. so uh, there's a question coming in from from Janet from Janet Anders Natalia so ah, um, so um, Janet is, is asking further to Alvor Alvaro's question um, I think Natalia confirmed the oscillation is coherent in the sense of it having a well-defined phase but I think Alvaro's question might have been if one can think of the nanotube being in a spatial superposition, and if ah. so, how large is that superposition? Um, oh, yes. So uh, we actually have a. So, well, I mean, the, the answer to this is uh, not. We, we haven't done that yet. Uh, the carbon nanotubes 
um, can be in their ground state because their resonance frequencies are, can be very high. So they can reach the, they can be in their ground state uh, at dilution fridge temperature, so at around 20 millikelvin. And uh, there are protocols. So we have uh, a, a paper on this, um, that uh, a system that we call displacement in which uh, you can uh, transfer a qubit state to the state of the um, uh, carbon nanotube. So you can have a, a carbon nanotube uh, in, coupled to, to a qubit. Uh, and uh, if the motion is dependent on the state of the qubit, uh, if you bring the qubit in superposition, you might be able to, put, to create a superposition of, of states of motion, basically. Um, and uh, uh, and that's a very exciting experiment, and, and, and we've been thinking about how how uh, to do it. Uh, but that would be um, that would be really cool. Something we would love to do. Great. Uh, thanks a lot again, Natalia. There's there's another question um, uh, from Avishak Das. Uh, since you can measure the charge carrier mobility in the presence or absence of the gate voltage. Uh, can the response be explained with a low order response theory, a low order non-equilibrium response theory? I guess this is a slightly theoretical question. I mean, uh, uh. Uh, the the um, the response of the yeah, the response of the response of what perhaps? Uh, um, yeah, so so uh, it's important to clarify something that I haven't been super uh, clear about. Uh, because I thought I would I would keep it simple, is that what we are creating in the carbon energy is, is, is we are not using it as a as a let's say one D channel, but as a it's a quantum dot. Right. So we create it electrostatically a confinement such that uh, we have these uh, energy levels, and uh, well the idea is uh, something that is not very really clear, but uh, something we are working on is trying to link. Uh, this electron transport mechanisms with the mechanics. Right. Uh, what is exact process there, you say? I see. Um, so let me just see if some more questions uh, come in there, Natalia, since we have a little bit of time. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you have no excuses now since your lab is powered down anyway, so you might as well just talk to a bunch of theorists. I don't want to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't mention the war. A very sensitive spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that the experimentalists are in quarantine, quarantine, it's 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 their time to shine, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think it would be possible to also couple to other modes, uh, like flexorial codes of the tube that may have a larger optomechanical coupling? Yes, so actually there is a very nice paper by, I think it's a Shahalilani's group, in which uh, what, what they show is that they form this, this uh, quantum dot in different uh, places, let's say, of the carbon nanotube, and they move it around. So first they have it here, and then there, and then there, and then there. And they can map the different modes, so how do they couple to different modes? So they couple to fundamental mode, or the first mode, and I just put the quantum node here, and the mode is, you know, uh, has a node there. Then you don't see coupling. It's a very good cool paper. Um, so yeah, I think we we think we did, we didn't investigate this further, uh, but but one could couple to different modes, and and it has to do a bit of, uh, with where the quantum dot actually forms. I see. So maybe since the questions are thinning out, maybe I can end with just some something, uh, Natalia. So um, as a theorist. You know, what would you tell us to calculate? Given that this is a new well, setup, what would you like us to be calculating? So, uh, well, something that, um, actually, I'm not sure about, uh, well, uh, I know uh, with, with uh, Juan and Janet and Alexia, uh, we, are, we are thinking on, uh, and 